Hello my friends, it's Jean-Michel Grosjeu talking about Successors, a game by Richard Berg and Mark Simonich, published by Phalanx Games for its fourth edition. A game about the succession wars uh, that followed the death of Alexander the Great, two centuries BC. If you watch this video, I suppose you already watched the two previous ones, and perhaps you think you have a good knowledge about the game and feel ready to sit at the game table, but wait, because it's not over till it's over, and I still have a few things to teach you. First, we need to recap the game setup, the sequence of play, and especially the flow of new units through reinforcements. This is an important part of the game you need to master. We will also take all this back to the historical line and see how the setup and the five game turns bring historical favor to the game. Then, we will see into detail all the different units you'll deal with. They are numerous and spice up the game. They include independent armies that are driven by events. And finally, we will dig through the deck of TK cards to give you a foretaste of what to expect. This third and last video will end with a general wrap-up of the game system and a view of all the handy player heads waiting for you to download on BoardGameGeek.com. Okay, that being said, let's jump right in. And let's see what the game setup looks like. We are at the very beginning of our game session, and here is the game map. First, we populate it by adding people who live there, the independent tribes. One independent PC in each space where there is an independent symbol, like these ones. Here we are. These are all the areas you will have to make siege rolls to control. Then, the five players each take their mat in the color they have chosen. The five player setup includes 10 generals, two for each player. Here they are. You'll find in the rulebook, chapter 4, which generals to take. Each general comes with its plastic figure. And note that only 10 generals are used in the setup, 10 out of 20 available cards. Each general comes with his army and a province he controls. Again, you will find this information in the rulebook. At this point, players don't know who controls what general. They will have to choose very soon, but before, in order to ease their choice, generals are put in their starting area or province. Also, we had the funeral cart in Babylon, where Alexander died, and all the heirs from his lineage, mainly Alexandros in Babylon and Heracles in Damascus. Philippos staying out of the map, he will enter the game through the play of a ticket card. And finally, the three influential women, Olympias in Molossia, Thessalonike in Pella, and Cleopatra in Sardes. And then, at last, players are ready to choose. General's cards are shuffled, face down, then, each player gets two cards at random, chooses one, and discards the other. They choose according to the general's ratings, but also their army and their starting position on the map. Then, the remaining five generals are shuffled and dealt again, randomly, so that every player now has two generals. Each general controls the province he is in, and so players put their political control markers in every area in his general's provinces, every area without independent PC. Okay, some starting provinces bring warships, Aegyptos and Macedonia, and each player can compute his initial victory points by adding the values of the provinces he controls. Then, each player receives the status of Champion of the Empire with the three legitimacy points that come with it. They will keep them as long as they don't attack each other. In our example, with eight victory points, Yellow player has the most points at start, and thus he gets the Usurper Ring. All other players can attack him without losing their Champion status. And finally, with Babylon, Red player gets the control of the funeral cart and Alexandros. Alexandros is worth 5 legitimacy points. 
while blue player in Damascus gets the control of Heracles. Heracles is worth two legitimacy points. Green player controls Macedonia, so he is the strategos and earns two legitimacy points. Perdicas and Leonatos are both worth one legitimacy point. As you see, players start with different levels of victory and legitimacy points, as well as different general ratings, army strengths, and control provinces. This is an uneven setup, and you guess that players will quickly have to discuss, negotiate, and seal alliances. The player with the less victory points, here blue player, decides who will be the first player. And because the first turn is some kind of a race, to grab uncontrolled provinces, blue player decides to go first. And here we are, ready to play turn number one. Let me recall the sequence of play you already know so well, and let me add what we just saw with the setup. At the beginning of each turn, there is a preparation phase where players check who is the usurper and who is the first player. The usurper is the most dangerous player, the most dangerous faction, dangerous for the balance of the empire. At the beginning of each turn, the usurper ring goes to the player who has the most victory points. If several players are tied, it goes to the one who owns the general with the most seniority. On the other hand, the player with the least victory points can decide who will be the first player. He won't be necessarily the first player himself, he is the one who decides which player will be the first player. Here, for example, yellow player with the least victory points can decide that green player will be the first player. And then he decides also the turn order, clockwise or counterclockwise. If there is a tie among several least victory points players, the tie is broken by the roll of a die. And here is mainly the preparation phase. During this phase, also, players check if something special happens for the current turn. A game of successors is played in five turns. On turn one, Alexander just died in Babylon, so players cannot move his funeral cart. The funeral cart is in Babylon and must stay in Babylon for the duration of turn one. Players cannot either bury Alexander on turn one. After that, nothing special on turn 2. Then, at the beginning of turn 3, Antipatros dies and is replaced by Polypercon. Wherever he is on the map or in the dispersed box, Antipatros figure and card are replaced by Polypercons. On turn 3 also, Demetrios joins Antigonos. The player who owns Antigonos gets Demetrios as reinforcement. And that means that this player will have three generals instead of two. This is an exception to the standard rule and players should keep that in mind when choosing generals at the beginning of the game. The one who chooses Antigonos will get Demetrios for free on turn 3. Next, turn 4, 310 BC. And this is the moment when Alexandros is old enough to take his father's throne. Remember, this is called a Regency victory. Whoever controls Alexandros, the player who has the most victory point plus legitimacy points, wins the game. Immediately, now at the beginning of turn 4, he wins unless, unless the player controlling Alexandros decides to kill him. He just has to declare the murder and discard Alexandros' figure. Of course, the five legitimacy points associated with Alexandros are lost. And so, if you have the largest sum of victory points plus legitimacy points, you should make sure that you control Alexandros, or at least that nobody controls him. Otherwise, you can be sure he will be assassinated. Okay, turn 4 is also the time when Alexander's dead body disappears. That's what happened in real history. Now, in the 21st century, we don't know where Alexander was actually buried. His body was probably stolen. And so, at the beginning of turn 4, if the funeral cart is still in play, it is discarded. And from now, no one can control it nor bury it. No one will gain the 2 or 10 legitimacy points for building Alexander's tomb. And so, 
if you think about it, you cannot move the funeral cart during turn 1 and it is discarded at the beginning of turn 4. Thus, you have precisely two turns to bring it from Babylon to Pella in Macedonia to build the tomb and earn the 10 legitimacy points. It is short, if this is how you intend to win the game, you'd better plan it in advance. Turn 4 is also the time from when it becomes possible to recruit a third general. As you remember, before that, players have two generals each and can recruit a new one by playing a ticket card only to replace a general killed in battle. From turn 4, players can recruit a third general and just a third one, not a fourth. The new limit is three generals per player and no one more. For example, the player owning Antigonos and who just earned a third general with Demetrios at the beginning of turn 3 already has three generals and cannot recruit one more. The same with General Peukestas, who can enter the game on a TK cards event. There are only three generals in reserve, Aristonous, Nearchos and Asandros, so with Demetrios and Peukestas, all the five players should be able to have three generals if no one died before that. Finally, turn five. The same as Alexandros in a previous turn, Heracles can sit on Alexander's throne. The player with the largest sum of victory points plus legitimacy points wins, unless Heracles is killed. This choice is up to the player who controls Heracles. And so you see how the game evolves with time. You'd better know these conditions, they are rather important to set your strategy. Just two small technical issues before going on. There is no reinforcements during turn 1, in fact that's because they are already included in your starting forces. And you cannot win on turn 1, because if you are lucky enough, you can draw Perdicas and Ptolemaios as starting generals, and begin the game with 10 victory points. With a little skill, you could rush 20 victory points during the first turn. The same with legitimacy if you begin with Perdicas and Antipatros that are worth 11 legitimacy points at setup. But no, you cannot rush to victory because you cannot win on turn 1 and that gives your opponents enough time to settle down. And now that you see the rhythm and the historical line of the whole game, let's talk about reinforcements. Reinforcements are very important because players start with not so many units on the map and they will lose some after the first battle. So they must plan a way to recover their strength and build new units on the long term. We already talked about that, now it's time to get the whole picture. First, players get two mercenary units each at the beginning of every turn during the reinforcement phase. These are the historical reinforcements. Whatever you do, you will always get your two mercenary units every turn. Two mercenaries per player, not per general. Each player gets the same number whether they have one, two or three generals. And then there are some bonuses. Two more mercenary units for the player having the most victory points. If tied, one mercenary unit for each tied player. Then, one loyal Macedonian unit for the player having the most legitimacy. If tied, it goes to the general with the highest seniority. And finally, one loyal Macedonian unit for the player controlling the province of Macedonia, the cradle of the empire. It's consistent, mercenaries go to the strongest man, while loyal units go to the most legitimate leaders. Other combat units comes by playing a TK card for the operation points or the event, or they come by waving your activation segment. And every time, the new units you gain are immediately put on the map. Okay, but where? The simplest way is to put your new units inside an existing army under the leadership of a general, any minor or major general already on the map at the time you get the new troops. Or you can also put your new units in any location you control without enemy units, of course. Especially when you get a new leader as reinforcement. 
you are not bound to put him in an existing army. You can put him on a location you control and doing so, create a new army. This can happen when you recruit a new general or simply when you get one of your generals back from the dispersed box. Dispersed units and generals are recovered during the reinforcement phase as if they were new troops. When adding new troops to the map, as long as these troops are with a general or a control major city, you can stack as many troops as you want. There is no limit. But otherwise, you are limited to two new combat units per location. Okay, now let's see what all that means. Let's suppose this is the reinforcement phase and red player can get his dispersed units back from the dispersed box. The easiest way is to put all dispersed forces under General Lysimachos already on the map. And because General Perdicas seniority is higher than Lysimachos, Perdicas automatically takes the lead and here we are. But there are other solutions. Two loyal units can go to this controls area in Kilikia, but no more than two units because there is no general there nor any major city. No unit can go to the red control area in Syria because there is an enemy army there. And there is still another solution. Red player can first bring his dispersed leader, Perdicas, to the map in an area he controls, then put all three loyal Macedonian units in that same area under his command because there is no limit to the number of reinforcements when a general is present. And if you cannot bring your new troops to the map, if you have no general and no control area free of enemy units, in this case only there is a last possibility, you can put your reinforcements in any area, either uncontrolled or independent, that is with a neutral Greek PC, free of any enemy unit in a province you control or a province no one is controlling. And voila, whether you get your new troops by regular reinforcements or by training units with a TK card or by an event, you put them immediately on the map under a general or in an area you control. And that's the same when you recover units from the dispersed box. Okay, you know how to build new troops and how to bring them to the map. And it's time now to summarize all combat units and their special abilities. You remember this screen, you saw it in my previous video. These are all combat units you can find on the battlefield. In fact, there are only five different types of units, mercenaries, loyal Macedonians, royal troops, silver shields and elephants. You know the first difference between them, brown units, mercenary and elephants are eliminated as soon as they lose the battle, these units are therefore very volatile, you can lose them all in only one battle, no matter how many you have. White units, loyal Macedonians, royal troops and silver shields are steadier. When they lose in combat, they roll on the attrition table and the remaining units are dispersed. So they erode slowly instead of disappearing all at once and you can hope to keep them through several turns. From there, the choice is obvious, you'd better build white units instead of brown. Well, that's easy to say, but white units are much harder to get. Mercenaries are the easy ones. A lot of generals start the game with mercenaries. Then, each turn, automatically, each player gets two mercenaries, two more if they qualify for bonuses. You can also train mercenaries by playing TK cards for operation points, and some TK cards also give new mercenaries through events. And if you are desperate enough, you can even waive your entire activation segment to gain one mercenary unit. The second basic unit is the loyal Macedonian. This one is on a white token, so it lasts longer, but a little bit harder to bring to the battlefield. All leaders have two loyal Macedonian units in their army at start. All leaders but Perdicas, who has royal troops instead. Every turn, the players who have the best legitimacy or the control of Macedonia get some loyal Macedonian units as bonus reinforcements. 
You can train loyal Macedonian by playing a TK card. It is just more than twice as expensive as mercenary with seven training points instead of three per unit. And finally, some event cards give you loyal Macedonian units. And so, mercenaries and loyal Macedonians are the two basic building blocks of your army. And you will play the most part of the game with these two. Let's see now more advanced units. Let's see the royal troops. First, in terms of efficiency and battle strength, they are exactly equivalent to loyal Macedonians. White tokens, two strength points per unit. The only difference is the purple strip. Because royal troops have something special. First, they cannot be recruited in any way. At game setup, the only eight existing royal units are divided between three generals, Perdicas, Antipatros and Crateros. These units can be eliminated through combat, but they will never recover and their number will not increase in any way. Also, because they are linked to the Empire in a very tight way, by their very nature, they should never fight against the Empire and they always follow their general's prestige. In real combat situations, here is how it works. Basically, royal troops fight for the general who has the most prestige. And prestige is equal to players' legitimacy points plus some special bonuses. Crateros, for example, has built-in bonus of two prestige points. Crateros is very popular with royal troops. Also, as we will see very soon, there are independent armies on the map. These are tribal local armies that are the Empire's natural enemies. So, every time a general defeats such an independent army, he keeps its counter and flips it to show he has a bonus of plus one prestige. And this lasts until the general's death. There is also a 4 prestige points bonus for defending the funeral cart or the tomb. This bonus goes only to the defending player in a combat and only if he is currently controlling the funeral cart or if the battle occurs in the tomb's location and he is currently controlling this location. And finally, there is a special TK card, the gift of oratory, that's worth 5 prestige points. And beware, this is a red surprise card. That means it can be played any time, at the time of a combat of course, just when your opponent thinks he has more prestige than you. Ok, so let's say there is a battle between red Crateros and black Antigonos. Let's have a look at the legitimacy track. Black player has a better legitimacy, but with a total bonus of plus 3, Red player has the best prestige. So, what happens? Royal troops don't fight against a general with a better prestige. So here, black player's royal troops won't fight. There is a battle just as if black royal troops were not here. Their combat strength is not added to black strength and black player cannot absorb hits with royal troops. If black player wins the battle, he gets his royal troops back and that's all. The same if it's a draw. But if black player loses, his royal troops pass to the enemy. They change side and they join the winner's army. And you must understand what it really means. Because you could think that royal troops are just like loyal Macedonian troops, but less reliable because another general with more prestige can steal them from you. Let's say you are a red player in a game where you decided to run for legitimacy. You fight for royal heirs control, you own Macedonia, in short, you are far ahead of the other players in terms of legitimacy. Even with the dreaded oratory card, they cannot beat you. Do you see what that means? That means you can go hunting for royal troops. If you attack armies that include royal troops, these royal troops won't fight against you, they won't take damage from your attack and, in the end, if you win of course, they will join your army. In a game of successors, there's always such a race for legitimacy and prestige. The one who wins this race can take possession of the whole force of 8 royal troop units and believe me, that's a huge advantage. During a siege, things are nearly the same. 
Besieging royal troops don't take part if the besieged general has a better prestige. And it can happen that because of that, a besieging army cannot comply with the prerequisite of three combat units. If royal troops are besieged and a general with better prestige gets one siege point after a siege roll, besieged royal troops change sides and join the besieger. One siege point is enough. Next, the Silver Shields. These units enter the game only when playing the event of a special TK card. Easy. When a player plays this event, he gets two Silver Shields units and places them with one of his armies in Asia. From then, this player can use them as some kind of powerful loyal Macedonian units. And that's all. The only trick with the Silver Shields is that their Heaven card is removed from the game when played and replaced by another TK card, this one, a surprise card that allows your opponent to eliminate one Silver Shield unit and steal the other, just before combat. Only one Heaven card in a deck of 69, Silver Shield are less likely to defect than Royal Troops. And finally, the unit you have all been waiting for, the elephants. They are brown units, so they disappear as soon as they lose a battle. Some generals have elephants from the game setup, but mainly elephant units enter the map by playing a TK card event. An elephant unit is exactly like a mercenary, but it has no strength. There is a question mark instead. And that means that nobody, even the player who owns them, know their strength until the battle resolution. At the time of the battle, the player owning the elephant unit throws an elephant die. This is a special die that gives the strength of the elephant unit as a number of small elephant symbol. Here, for example, the strength of the elephant unit is three. This value can change from a battle to another. The die is rolled before each resolution. The possible values are zero twice, 1, 2, 3, or 4. If you fight with a token that represents two elephant units, of course, you throw two dice, and so on, one die per unit, not per token. There is a special unique TK card that brings four units of elephants, a token that can represent, if you are lucky enough, a strength of 16. Elephants are also more susceptible to attrition rolls, Every time an attrition roll is needed, when passing through an independent stronghold or after a naval interception, if you transport your elephants on boats, you must lose one elephant unit if you roll a six. That's what this little E letter means. And voila, you know all combat units in the game. Now, what you see on the screen is the list of all combat units that players use in their armies. But... There are other units that just don't belong to any player. These are the independent armies, Glaucias, Ceutes, Ariarates, Leostenes, and Philon. All five begin the game on the map. These armies can be active, soldiers ready in battle order on the field, or inactive, not yet committed to the war. Inactive armies are turned face down. At the beginning of the game, three armies are inactive. The two active armies are Leostenes and Ariarates. When an independent army is active, it leaves its barracks and moves to the battlefield. This is shown as a white arrow on the map. So, during the game setup, the two active armies are moved down the arrow to an actual location on the map. Leostenes in Lamia, Ariarates in Comana. And from then, without any special event, nothing happens. Even the two active independent armies stay where they are and do nothing. Of course, a player can decide to attack one of these armies, especially if he wants to take control of the location the independent army is on. Such a battle is fought like a standard battle between two generals. Here, Seleucus, with a strength of 7, attacks independent general Leostenes, whose strength is 6, the number in the middle. Column 7 versus column 6 on the battle table. Blue player rolls his dice and another player, whoever, rolls for the independent army. Blue player applies his battle rating and so does Leostenes according to the battle rating on his counter. 
you must see an independent army counter as a combat unit and a general both printed on the same token. In our example, it is a draw. Blue army loses one combat unit and retreats where it came from. In order to eliminate an independent army, you must win the battle. A draw is not enough. The independent army strength is printed directly on its counter, so it cannot just lose one combat unit. Either it loses it all, or it loses nothing. But if the independent army loses the battle, it is eliminated. Ok, this is when independent armies are passive, when they stay on the map waiting for the players to seek and attack them. But three special TK card events can activate independent armies. There is one event per inactive independent army, one for Glaucias, one for Ceutes, and the last for Philon. Let's see what it looks like with Glaucias. The text on the card says that if Glaucias is in his holding box, that is, if he is still inactive, he activates and enters the map. For that, his token is flipped to his active side, and he just follows the arrow. If, like here, there is a choice, it is up to the player who plays the TK cards to choose what location. Then, the second part of the card says that all independent active armies now move up to three movement points. All active armies. In our example, that means both armies that were active from the beginning of the game, plus Glaucia's army we've just activated. The player who's playing the TK card moves independent armies at will, up to three movement points. He cannot roll for siege, he cannot do naval movement, but he can attack players' armies. At the end of the movement, an independent grey political control marker is put under every independent army on a minor city or a stronghold. Independent armies cannot take control of major cities. Let's say the situation is shown here. Yellow player just played his TK card, he activated Glaucias as we saw, and now he can move all three independent armies. He first attacks Blue General with Leosthenes. Let's suppose the independent army wins the battle. Blue General loses all his brown units, plus one white unit, it's a royal troop, what a shame, and the rest goes to the dispersed box. Leosthenes cannot move further because battle ends movement. Glaucias attacks the Black General. This general can choose to retreat behind the walls of the major city he controls. And because only two combat units can enter a city, he loses one mercenary unit, there is an overrun situation. And because an independent army cannot roll for siege, the two armies will stay there. There is a state of siege that will last forever until the independent army moves elsewhere, or until Black General decides to attack it. The major city will stay black controlled. And finally, yellow player moves Ariarates like this, and he puts an independent PC marker on the final location. Note in this case that it deprives a green player of the control of Cappadocia. So as you see, independent armies are a powerful threat, and you'd better keep an eye on them if they are lurking behind your lines. But luckily, they cannot go and attack everywhere, and at least some of them must stay inside their own territories. Let's go back to the map, as it is at the beginning of the game. Leosthenes starts the game activated and ready to fight as soon as one of the three TK cards is played. But for the duration of the game, he must stay within the boundaries of Hellas and Thessalia. His army can only stand in one of these two provinces' locations. The same with Ariarates, who must always stay in Cappadocia. Then there is Philon. This one is special. He starts the game inactive and he becomes active only if his specific TK card is played. He moves to one of his two possible starting locations for one movement point. You follow the arrows. And from then, he moves up to three movement points and will move again every time such a TK card is played, but always westward. That means that this army must always be at the end of its movement further west than its starting point. And thus, 
One ticket card after another, Finland's army will march through the empire and finally will be bound to cross the sea at the Hellespont because, remember, an independent army cannot use a naval movement. And as soon as it reaches Hellas, Philon's army is eliminated. And that's because Philon's army was made of Greek colonists sent far away into Asia by Alexander and who just wanted to go back home at Alexander's death. The two first armies in this list are on the map from the beginning of the game. The third is brought by a TK card, but all three disappear from the game when they are eliminated and don't come back. There are two other independent armies, slightly different on this point, because they can come back to the game after being eliminated, Glaucias and Ceutes. They both enter the game when their TK card is played, they can both move freely without any territory restriction, and when eliminated, they respawn to the map if their card is played again. And that's it for independent armies. There are five enemies to all players and strong enough to be a real threat you cannot overlook. Remember that defeating an independent army gives you one prestige point that helps you claim control over royal troops. And finally, now that you know all units in the game, it's time to summarize all characters from the royal family because they are so important in the victory conditions. You must have a clear view on how they work. Three heirs, three influential women, and the funeral cart. First, the heirs, the easiest ones. To control a heir, you just have to enter his location with one of your armies. Green General Polypercon enters Heracles' location, and voila, Heracles is green controlled. Green player immediately earns his two legitimacy points. If another player already controls the heir, you still control if you win a battle against him. Things are more difficult with influential women. To control them, you need to play the corresponding TK card. Each woman has her own TK card. For Olympias, playing the card gives you an immediate control over her. You don't need any army where she is. As instructed by the card, you get one free mercenary unit, four if she is in Eperos, her personal guard, and you can put a minor general of yours with it. And then you control Olympias and gain her three legitimacy points. Beware, it doesn't work if Olympias is already controlled by another player. She must be uncontrolled when you play her card. And that is true for all three influential women. If you want to control them, they must first be uncontrolled. And how do you remove enemy control over an influential woman? By winning a battle. Here, red player attacks a green minor general. He wins and thus Olympias becomes uncontrolled. Later, red player should play Olympias card to get her control and legitimacy. For Cleopatra and Thessalonike, it's a little bit more difficult because you must have an army on your location at the time you play the card. The three influential women being located around Greece, the best to do if you aim at their legitimacy points is to keep some army, even a minor one, in this vicinity and wait for the opportunity of a good ticket card draw. Okay, and finally, the funeral card. To begin with, it works exactly like hers. It belongs to the player who goes to its location and who can then bring it with him, with the exception that it must stay in Babylon during the first turn. Okay, but remember, the card is worth nothing, no victory points, no legitimacy. It just gives prestige in defense for the control of royal troops. In order to use this funeral card at its best, you must bury Alexander's body, you must turn the cart into the tomb. Burying Alexander can be done only during turn 2 or 3, because on turn 1, you can do nothing but let the cart where it is in Babylon. And at the beginning of turn 4, if not already turned into the tomb, the cart is lost and removed from the game. So during turn 2 or 3, a player must first control the funeral cart and he must bring it to a major city. Then, he just has to declare that he buries Alexander's body and turns the cart into the tomb. This can be done only during the forage phase or at the end of a turn. So, 
at the end of a blue or red cycle according to our seconds of play, no matter who controls the major city. But as soon as the tomb replaces the cart, any control ring is lost. The tomb by itself belongs to nobody. No one can control the tomb. Instead, two legitimacy points are given to the player controlling the city where the tomb lies. So, of course, you'd better bury Alexander in a city you control. Once built, the tomb cannot be moved, but players can still fight for the control of its location and the two legitimacy points that come with it. There is a special objective to bury Alexander in his home city of Pella in Macedonia. And this time, 10 legitimacy points go to the player who actually built the tomb, regardless of who controls the city. For example, if Pella is controlled by red player, but yellow player brings the cart there and built the tomb, 10 legitimacy points go to yellow player and nothing to red player. And after that, nobody will ever get the two points for controlling Pella. Pella is an exception. Whoever built the tomb in Pella earns immediately 10 legitimacy points, and that's all. And this is nearly the end of this video. You know all the rules, but we must take a little time to browse the deck of TK cards. These cards are so important in this game that you must have at least some overview of what you can expect from the four cards you will draw each turn. And first, let's do some math. There are 69 TK cards in the deck. 32 grey standard cards, 19 yellow bonus cards, and 18 red surprise cards. Every turn, the 5 players draw 4 cards each for a total of 20 drawn cards. But remember that each time you play or discard a red surprise card, you replace it immediately by a new card you draw. That means that red cards don't count. And we can say that every turn, players draw 20 cards out of 51, 32 greys plus 19 yellows. Thus, every single card in the game has 20 chances out of 51 to be drawn each turn. That is very close to 40%. We keep this value in mind because it gives us a kind of scale to gauge the importance of each type of card. Also, we can say that if you are waiting for a specific card, for example, Cleopatra card because your army is on her location and you wait for this card to control her, your chance of drawing this unique card is 4 out of 51 equals 8% each turn. This is very low and that means you should not build your whole strategy on the draw of one specific card. And these values are the same for all game turns because the deck is reshuffled every turn. All cards together, the operational values are 17 twos, 18 threes, and 16 fours. So you have roughly the same probability for each value for a resulting mean value of three operation points. So when you build up your strategy, you can hope for 12 operation points per turn. And now let's see the events and what you can wait from your hand of four cards. And first, the few cards you already know very well. The three cards that activate independent armies and the three cards that give control over influential women. Three cards, I do the math for you. That means that, for example, you can be quite sure, 80% sure, that one independent army card will be drawn every turn. And because each such card trigger the move of all activated independent armies, keep in mind that active independent armies will move and attack almost every turn. There is also a special card to activate Philippos, the second heir in Alexander's lineage, and three cards that interferes with royal family. Drink the Hemlock eliminates a royal family member altogether, Treachery captures one, and Plants of Their Own moves one of the women on the map. And these are the cards that drive the royal family. Then you have the so important 14 cards that bring you reinforcements. The first two are very simple. You play them, you get the reinforcements, easy. But then the following four cards give you reinforcements in some specific provinces only, where you must control at least one location. 
and for these five others, you get the reinforcements wherever you want, but still, you must control some specific locations or provinces. And so, this map gives you an idea of what provinces are key in terms of available reinforcements. Two specific cards give elephant units and rely on the control of any space in Asia for Asian elephant or Africa for African elephants. And finally, the dreaded silver shields. Only two combat units, but worth three strength points each. They are linked to the ownership of an army in Asia, and as soon as it is played, this card is eliminated out of the game and replaced by a red card that eliminates one unit of silver shields. So, that means that these units come with their weak points, but still, they are very powerful. Okay, and these are the collection of 14 reinforcement cards you can get from the deck. Okay, go on. The next two cards give you a new general, Cassandros or Peukestas. It's very powerful knowing that each player has only two generals. There are conditions to comply with, I let you read the cards, but in the end, these two cards allow you to have one more general than your fellow opponents, and this is a huge advantage. Next, the three major campaign cards. With this card, you can activate two generals, and why is it so powerful? Remember, you play your ticket cards at this step of the game sequence. At this point, you can spend your ticket card for its operational points and activate one general with four movement points. But if you use the same card for its event, you will activate two generals with four, five, or even six movement points. And this is in addition to the standard activation phase that follows. In other words, these cards allow you to play twice in a row. Next, the three unrest cards. This card must be played for the event. Because it is a yellow bonus card, you can also use it for its three operational points. But you cannot decline the unrest event. When you play this card, you must roll two dice on the special unrest table. For example, here, you would put an independent PC marker in any location in Libya or Aegyptos. The player who plays the card can choose the location as long as it is unoccupied, but he can remove an enemy PC by doing so. If there is no possible location, the player can choose another adjacent province. Unrest spreads is very close to unrest, the difference being that the new independent PC marker must be placed adjacent to any former independent PC. With these four unrest cards in the deck, you can be pretty sure that one independent PC at least will be added to the map every turn. The following influence spreads is very close to unrest spreads, but it spreads your own PC marker instead of independent ones. And then there is a series of five more cards that produce similar effects, removing enemy PCs and or replacing them with your own. Finally, two cards, Epidemic and Desertion, are aimed at eliminating forces inside your enemy's armies or even to steal such forces. Okay, and now it's time to see the long series of cards you play during a battle or just before or just after. Let's call them battle cards. They are mainly red surprise cards that you play during the battle, interrupting your enemy's play. Deception and Surprise is played before a battle to increase your chances of interception or evasion. Cavalry Superiority, Anti-Elephant Device, Mutiny or Gift of Oratory are all cards made to lessen the odds in battle or to even steal units from your opponent, the two last being specifically aimed at royal troops that can be stolen by a change in prestige. Price of Failure, Just a Flesh Wound, and Repercussions of Defeat change the aftermath of a battle or siege. Speaking of siege, Traitor Inside City, Pottery Supplied, Surprise Sortie, and Alexander's Ghost add or subtract siege points. The Helepolis card adds a figure to a siege to give a plus one bonus for all of the siege resolution die rolls. The Helepolis figure cannot move, it is always linked to one particular siege. When this siege is over, the Helepolis is discarded. 
Then six cards about sea operation, four of them adding a bonus to naval combat or cancelling a naval battle, and of course the Kilikia Pirates, the card you need to get the Kilikia Warship token, and the Cretan Liar that removes the Kilikia fleet and makes it available again. There are now only eight cards left, each with its unique event. Let's look at them one by one. Abris. You can play this card just when an opponent plays his own TK card. Abris cancels the card, it cancels the event, but it can even cancel the use of operation points. So whenever the card is played or for whatever reason, Abris cancels it. There are only three exceptions. You cannot cancel Silver Shields, nor the upgrading of a fleet, nor the recruiting of a Major General. The player with the cancel doesn't lose his turn. He draws a replacement card from the deck and play again immediately. So, for example, if you cancel the play of a card with a value of 4 that was played for operations, if the player draws another card with the same value of 4, he can play it immediately and your Abris card is useless. In fact, this card is more efficient when cancelling an event. Aura Mazda and Ariman. With this card, you can draw a card randomly from another player's hand, and this player replaces it with a card he draws from the deck. Beware, despite being a red surprise card, this card can be played only during your own turn, so it cannot be used to cancel another player action. Next, Oracle and Condemnation. The first gives one legitimacy point. In fact, this point is attached to a general, so you can give it to another player as part of a negotiation, for example, but also, if you attach it to one of your own generals, you can still lose this legitimacy point if this general is killed. Condemnation is the opposite. You attach a penalty of minus three legitimacy points to a general. In the same way, its owner can avoid the loss if this general is later killed. Diplomatic marriage. If, uh, let's say, red player plays this card in front of yellow player, yellow player can still avoid its effects by discarding a red card immediately. If not, both players put a PC marker on the card and they cannot attack each other for the whole duration of the turn. The fun part of this card is that you should play it soon in the turn to maximize its protection, but Doing so, you increase your chance of being cancelled by the play of a red card. The Pontic Fleet card allows one of your armies to cross the big northern sea, the Pontos Euxenos, between Trapezos and any port on this sea, in one way or the other. This is a very specific card, but it can allow some surprise move. Treasure City looted. This card targets the three richest cities in Asia, Babylon, Sousa, and Ekbatana. All three are shown on the map with a golden coin symbol, and to loot one of these cities, you must first control it. Then, you play this card and earn immediately 10 operation points you can spend in any combination to place pieces, activate generals as force march, and train troops. This can be done only once per city, an already looted city is marked with a special marker. And finally, the last card, the foundation of a capital. The goal of this card is to establish your own capital city to show your power to the world, as if you were already on Alexander's throne. And first, you can play this card only if you are a successor. That means, if you already lost your status of champion by attacking another player. Here, black player is a successor, so he plays this card as an event and immediately puts his foundation marker on a minor city with one of his armies in a province he controls. Then later, he must still pay another TK card with an operation value of 4, his army still being on the foundation location. You should see it as if these soldiers were actually building the city. Then. Black player changes his foundation marker for his capital city token, and this capital city is worth two victory points. This location is now a major city, 
That's why it is depicted with this large square token. If any other player takes control of it, he destroys it and takes the token that is worth one victory point. And this capital city with the same color cannot be built again. And now, now my job is done. You know all the rules to play a full game of successors. And before we part ways, before you fly your own wings, let's wrap it up through some handy player aids. First, the sequence of play and its two main components, the play of one ticket card followed by the activation of all your generals. This is the heart of the game, played four times by the five players, one blue cycle per ticket card and you restart five times for the five turns of the game. During your activation, you move your armies and you fight. With your ticket card, you can also train troops and place political control markers. Doing that, you take control over locations, then over provinces to earn victory points. You also take control over people from the royal family and other things that gives you legitimacy points. You win the game with 20 victory points or 18 legitimacy points, or the largest sum of the two when Alexandros or Heracles get to the throne at the beginning of turns 4 and 5. During the game, your main tool is your armies, led by your generals. They fight each other during battles that they can avoid through evasion or cause with interception. Major cities require a siege where defending units can hide behind the city's walls. Armies are made of combat units of five types. You get these units through reinforcements, training or with some TK cards events. Royal troops tend to follow the general with the most prestige, prestige being very close to legitimacy but with some differences. Finally, you have to know how to deal with the royal family because they can help you to get victory without conquering a large territory. Burying Alexander's body in his home city of Pella can be an efficient way to victory. Some independent grey armies will lurk through the empire and strike your rear if you don't pay attention. Grey armies are enemies to all players. And finally, you can quite easily cross the seas through blue dotted path, the naval links. But as soon as players get warships, things become more difficult. With warships, you can cancel enemy naval movements, you can lock the sea. And that's it, you'll find these handy player aids on successors dedicated page on boardgamegeek.com. I hope you enjoyed my series of videos, and I hope you'll enjoy this wonderful game, a cornerstone of multiplayer wargaming. Feel free to tell your friends about my videos, this is the best way to prepare for a game session while avoiding a long explanation of the rules. Goodbye my friends, salut les amis, je suis Jean-Michel Grosjeux.